in this fifth session now on Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, we focus on this middle part. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then here comes the ground or the support, the argument. Because, for, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. But as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to your husbands. So, Father, as we attempt to understand the support for this statement on submission and this statement on submission, right here in the middle, grant great wisdom. We want to go deep with Paul's thinking here and see if we can get inside his inspired thought in order to bring our thought into conformity to his and then our lives, our marriages. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me write out the parallel that I see. So here's wives, and wives are subject to husbands. As the church is subject to Christ. Now, what he says here, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body. So let's say husbands. Our head of wife as Christ is head of church. And what we see here is that a wife's subjection corresponds to a husband's headship just as uh, the church's subjection corresponds to Christ's headship over the church. And we spent two sessions on unpacking the as. How does the church's subjection to Christ become a model for a wife's subjection to her husband? Because we saw that there are ways in which we, as a church, are subject to Jesus that a wife cannot be subject to her husband, since he might want to lead her into sin sometimes, as we saw from First Peter. Now we're going to have to do the same thing here, won't we? How much time will we need to spend on this? Because it is obvious that Christ is the head of the church in ways that the husband is not the head of the wife. Whoa, Christ is perfect, right? Christ is omnipotent. Christ never sins. Christ never gives any bad guidance, and on and on the differences between the. So we, we have to ask serious questions about this as here. So the agenda we have now is, number one, we need to know what's the meaning of Christ being the head of the church. Then we need to pass that meaning through this as into the meaning of what does it mean for a husband to be the head of a wife. So that's where we're going. But before we go there in this session, I wanted to do something that might be a little unexpected, but I think it's really important. And it's to point out what Paul didn't say. He could have said and didn't, wives, submit to your husbands as Adam, before the fall, was the head, the representative head of Eve. He could have said that. That's true. Let me show you some evidence that that's true. Five evidences. 
Adam was created first, and Paul makes a big deal out of that as to why uh, the women in the church should submit to the elders. The man's personal name, Adam, was the name that God called both of them as a couple, just like today so many couples rightly give the man's name the name of the couple because that's the way God did it in Genesis 5.2. The woman was created as a helper suited for him. Though the woman sinned, drawing the man with her into eating the forbidden fruit, nevertheless, God calls the man to account first. You'd think he'd go to Eve first and say, what have you done? He didn't. He knew exactly who had sinned and what pattern their fall was, and he went straight to the man to call him to account, because that's the way he had set it up in creation. And fifth, and there are four or five others you could cite, but I'll just do five. Paul makes Adam the representative of the human race in the origin of sin, not Eve. So, for those reasons, I'm saying that here it would have been very biblically true and accurate and even helpful, perhaps, to say, wives, submit to your own husbands because God set it up like that before the fall. It wasn't the fall that brought about submission and headship. It was there before the fall. Why didn't he do that? And here's my answer that I'm suggesting to you. Because Paul is rescuing marriage from the curse. How? By making, not making, creation the model for marriage in Christ, but by making Christ the model of marriage in Christ. Not by making pre-fall Adam and Eve the model, but by making Christ and the church the model. That's really significant. You see what I'm getting at? He could have gone back before the fall and said, let's get this, let's get this messed up, sinful, fallen relationship of abuse and control fixed, and let's fix it by going back and making it just like it was before the fall. And he doesn't do that. He goes to the church and Christ, not to Adam and Eve. So my argument is that while he could have said, be subject to your husbands because that's the way it was in the beginning, and that's true, that would be a good argument, but rather he is rescuing marriage from the curse by going straight to Christ and the church. That's going to have huge implications for the way Christians think about their relationship. To clarify that, let's go back and see what the curse was and why I'm saying this. Here's a picture of the curse. God comes to woman and he says, this is, this is the penalty now he's putting on the woman. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be sometimes translated for your husband as if it's a sexual desire, and that may be part of it. But I think the ESV is on to something here when it says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In other words, she's going to want to rule over him, control him, and it's not going to work. He's stronger, and he's going to wind up being abusive ruler. That's the curse. You see it? Here's the support for that. You jump over to the next chapter, and you see in Hebrew and in English the very same wording. God is talking to Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching. Picture like a lion crouching at the door. And then here's this very wording of, the, of what God said to the woman. Sin's desire, and you could translate it, is for you. But what would that mean? that sin's desire is for you. It means sin wants to ruin you. The, the lion wants to 
eat you. Sin's desire is, is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You shall rule over it. It's the same verb. You shall rule over it. So what I'm saying is that the curse is battle, marriage, warfare. What does it look like? It goes in two directions in women and men. So the effects of the fall on God's created order of the husband loving, the husband's loving leadership and the wife's intelligent submission. So I'm arguing that before the fall, husbands were to be lovingly, caringly, protectingly, providingly uh, leaders, and wives were to be intelligently, willingly, gladly in submission so that the marriage relationship was a beautiful complementarity. And what happened? Here's what happened. The effects of the fall on men, domineering, control, and abuse, or passive dereliction of responsibility, a couch potato or a wife beater, or lots of things in between. The effects of the fall on women, insubordinate, aggressive control, or coquettish sexual manipulation. And when I say that Paul is rescuing marriage from the curse by making Christ and the church the model of husband and wife. What I mean is, by pointing husbands to Christ and by pointing wives to the church, this is forbidden. This is forbidden. This is forbidden, and this is forbidden, and it's forbidden in a most life-giving, beautiful, glorious way, because Christ and the church have a magnificent, perfect, eternal relationship. So, all of that (laughs) is a reflection on what Paul didn't say. We will turn now to what does the headship of Christ over the church mean, and then Understanding this as what does that mean for how a husband is the head of the wife? And keep in mind that this great relationship of Christ and the church is the ground of this and this not Adam and Eve, even though they had a beautiful complementary relationship before the fall.